Welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton. And we're here at the Oz ACPDM conference in Cairns, Australia, to interview world leading researchers, clinicians, and people with lived experience to support your practice in being more evidence based. We are back at the Research Works podcast booth at Oz ACPDM. I am joined now on day two of recording with, uh, by Amanda Kamis. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Hello. Um, Amanda, we spoke to Israt Jahan yesterday, uh, the other recipient of this very prestigious PhD platform. You also were one of the recipients of this platform. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Wasn't Israt's speech brilliant? It was beautiful. I got very emotional. It was incredibly <laughs> emotional and yet just an incredible body of work, as is yours. And I'm very excited to unpack that with you in this episode. But before we do that, let's tell everyone a little bit about you, as well as being uh, the PhD platform recipient at the conference. You're a speech pathologist and postdoctoral research fellow with over 15 years experience improving feeding and communication disorders for infants with cerebral palsy. Yes, makes me sound old. (laughs) You certainly don't look old. Thanks. (laughs) So you work at... at the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Institute and University of Sydney. I do, yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And the title of your PhD platform was Innovative Evidence-Based Assessment and Treatment of Oropharyngeal Dysphagia and Communication Disorders in Infants and Young Children at High Risk of Cerebral Palsy. You did it. I think we're out of time now. (laughs) It's a long title. And I note that uh, obviously Dana isn't able to be with us for this recording. She's left me with the trickiest title to pronounce. So You did very well. I'm impressed you could be a speech yourself. You can give me feedback later. (laughs) So Amanda, you know, this is such important work and I'm really excited to hear, you know, about this journey of a PhD, because PhDs, you, we throw that word around a lot, but PhDs are a journey and, and often there's a journey before the journey. So can you tell us a little bit about this work, how, it, how you came to arrive at doing a PhD in this area? Yeah, so I was a speech pathologist for probably close to eight years, I think, at that point when I'd started, yeah. um, which was eight years ago now. Um, and I was getting very frustrated that a lot of the work, well, all of the work that we were doing as speech pathologist just had no evidence to support it or very, very low evidence. And the ability to find that research was even harder. Yeah. Um, so I've always kind of had a an interest in the early intervention space and and we know from research in other areas that getting in there early is very important, the whole neuroplasticity approach. Um, And I, I don't know, I I wanted to uh, try and contribute a little bit more and we, you do informal bits of of research and um, quality appraisals of papers and those sorts of things and you just kind of you get defeated as a clinician when you come out every time with the same answer that more research is needed. Uh, So I thought, well, rather than spend my time coming up with the same answer every time and looking at the research, may as well invest that time into Into actually doing doing, it. Yeah, actually doing some research. Yeah, instead of waiting for the answers, you thought you'd go and get some yourself. Yes, but underestimating how much time (laughs) that would take. (laughs) And I think that that's kind of... A rite of passage for a PhD. Everyone starts off, you know, with really high expectations of of what is achievable within a PhD. Um, You know, you're going to solve all of the problems that you set out to solve. And, you know, for a lot of the time, that's true. Sometimes they're different problems to the ones that you set out to solve in the first place. But tell us a little bit about uh, the the evidence base for treatment of oropharyngeal dysphagia. prior to you starting your PhD? Uh, There's no response. Zero. Zero. (laughs) We did a systematic review um, and we found found five studies. There were very small samples of maybe five children uh, and very, very low quality. Mm. So even though it was low quality, uh, we were able to find little threads of, of hope there that mode learning and neuroplasticity approaches and using those principles yeah. is the way forward yes. or certainly worth investigating further. Yeah. And so that was the, um, the seed that planted in our brains of developing the Baby Eat program, okay. which we did as part of my research. Okay. Yeah. okay, so talk to us about 
baby eats, what what is it? How yeah, how does it work and yeah. so what studies were wrapped around it? Yeah. yeah. So it stands for let me get this right. <laughs> baby intensive early active treatment. And it is all about, it, it's, its foundation is motor learning and neuroplasticity, which as speech pathologists we have prior to this hadn't focused on from a communication point of view or from a feeding point of view. Uh, a little bit in the adult space um, for patients or people who've had a stroke, um, but definitely not in the uh, paediatric world. And so it's an intensive approach where we tested uh, baby eat against standard care Mm -hmm. and it's a 12-week program that's quite intensive. So the first four weeks, uh, I was the clinician for all of the research. I went out to see these families in their homes twice a week for four weeks and then once a week for the following eight weeks. And we were really trying to push these babies to do things that traditionally as speech pathologists we just wouldn't do. Mm. And it it makes sense because we're all very worried about the risks of aspiration and uh, that come with dysphagia. So we know that in cerebral palsy, um, aspiration pneumonia is the second most common cause of death. So obviously we need to be very careful Um, and clinically I think we got to a point where being we were being too careful. Yeah. And so we were using lots of compensations like thickened fluids and purees, um, but they're not actually giving these kids opportunity to ever try mm. anything else. And challenge themselves. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like going to the gym, right? You challenge yourself at the gym. Yeah. And you do it in a safe way where you don't injure yourself. Otherwise, you know, you'll end up seeing a physio. Yes. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, we, we wanted to be able to do this or see if we could do this and challenge these babies in a safe way that they were really enjoying um, and improve their skills that way yeah. by giving them opportunities, just incrementally challenging them, incrementally reducing the compensations they had, how thick the fluids they were, um, and give them, yeah, little snippets of, of opportunity to try. Yeah, fantastic. And then uh, I suppose the next question is what... What did you find? <laughs> yeah. What were your key results? Yeah, so it was a small sample. Yeah. Um, all up, we had 12 children and it was a, a randomised control trial. Uh, so we had six children in the baby eat group and five in standard care. I think that's right. Yeah. Maybe seven in, seven in baby eat and five in standard care. And the results were actually really promising. So in terms of fluids, they were drinking better from a cup They were drinking thinner fluids if they were on thickened fluids to start off with. Um, In terms of their solids, they were eating more advanced foods. Uh, They And even though we were challenging them, none of them were at risk of aspiration. Nobody had aspiration pneumonia. There were no hospitalisations. Even though they were having more advanced foods that needed, in in many cases, needed a lot more chewing, Um, they weren't any less efficient with their meal times. They were, uh, and it didn't impact how much volume they were eating or their nutritional intake either. So even though we're challenging them, there were no risks in in our study. Yeah. So that was that was really it's fantastic. And you know, one of the things I took away from, you know, the, what you talked through in your platform was how enthusiastic the families were about being involved in the program as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Thank you. I I couldn't agree more. Um, And one of the measures that we used was the feeding swallowing impact scale, which really looks at how stressful uh, meal times can be for families and the impact on their quality of life mm-hmm. and just daily living you know it, it, it takes so much more time to prepare a modified meal for a baby yes. or or your meal times last for an hour or two hours long sometimes yeah. um, so in this measure we found that it tests three different domains and across all three domains we saw improved results and better results in the baby eat group than we did in standard care that's fantastic. And I think that's uh, really reassuring for families as well, given what you just what talked about before in terms of the risk factors and, you know, things that I imagine 
families have in the back of their minds when it comes to risk of aspirational pneumonia and things like that. Yeah. And that's really quite reassuring, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it absolutely was. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you how lovely it was to be invited into these family homes yeah. and share meal times with them yeah. and to see the impact and to see the bonding happening and connection mm. because meal times were less stressful yeah. for everybody. It was amazing. It was really lovely to see that yeah. impact. One of the things before we wrap up I really wanted to talk to you about is you know, the, the translation of these overarching principles of, you know, evidence-based therapy, neuroplasticity, um, you know, can you just talk briefly about how you incorporated that into this program? Because as you said, you know, it's something that I think we're all familiar with as clinicians, but not something that is perhaps historically been applied in no. the speech pathology world. Yeah. yeah, and it was a challenge and we, we looked at the adult literature and there are some motor learning and, and um, neuroplasticity approaches there, but you need to be able to follow instructions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, swallow really hard yes. or don't swallow um, until I kind of tell you. Yeah. And when you're working with babies under 12 infants, months, yeah. you just can't. <laughs> no. And so it, it took a very long time to try and, and come up with alternatives to this. Um, and so we had to kind of think laterally and also think about what we've been doing clinically and talk with my colleagues and teams around what, what other ideas are out there. How can we try and translate this? And we ended up coming up with a, a very um, strategic and, and strict protocol, which we haven't published, but once we do a bigger study, we will. Um, but it's essentially just about, and, and to be honest, it's not really rocket science. It's just about reducing the level of support that we give them and giving them small opportunities, you know, a couple of mils of thin water at a time, or rather than a super slow flow tea, try them with a faster tea, or don't pace them with a bottle as often as you used to, see how they go. And when you reassess them as frequently as we were, because we were seeing them frequently, you can actually try and test them with some of these. And if it works, great. You can try and practice that skill a little bit more in these small increments. If it doesn't, maybe give them some more time and then try again. But the the key here was how often we were seeing them because it allowed us to reassess them quite frequently as opposed to traditionally where you see them maybe once every three yeah. months. And there's just not that opportunity yeah, to try and embed some of these strategies, is that's there? That's it, yeah. yeah. And we saw within the standard care group that two of the kids didn't get any services yeah. in three months. And the maximum within three months was four sessions. Like it was, it's just yeah. quite dire traditionally. It is, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think a, the big part of it is seeing them frequently to give them opportunities to see whether they're safe um, yeah. to try small, small challenges. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, it's something that we've spoken about a lot at this conference that task specificity and meeting children where they're at and really taking the time to think that through and as you say try out those different strategies and don't be afraid to pivot if things aren't working out how you originally thought they might or you know how they how that child is on that day yeah yeah absolutely and I think I don't I don't know how it is in your world but in the pediatric feeding space online and social media is such a big um influence for a lot of families and they're seeing some of these interventions that aren't task specific so looking at chewy tubes and vibrating tools and pacifiers and and they don't as closely align to motor learning into um, principles as a direct approach where you're actually using food or fluid that are whole tasks Um, and so we we just gave these kids the opportunities if, if they can safely manage food and drink Give it to them. Yeah. Give them the opportunity to try. There's no point practicing with silicon when you can practice with real food. With food, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that, that social media piece is something that we speak about a lot as well. And I'm, I'm so pleased you brought that up because I think, you know, this is this work that you and the team are doing is the start of something, you know, really big in speech pathology space so congratulations for that talk to us a bit about where to next for you and and this work yeah so you kind of hinted at something you know a bigger study that yes yeah will be coming yeah, out well, soon this is this is the pie in the sky yeah. and and to be honest I'm, I'm kind of in this state of um trying to figure out if it's the chicken or the egg first okay. so 
we, one of the challenges with the study was the outcome measures that we have in speech pathology in this age group are pretty terrible. Yeah. Um, so we're faced with the challenge of, okay, do we invest our time into creating an assessment tool that will be more reflective and um, responsive to change over time? Yeah. And that can be used from birth up till at least two years old. Um, or do we go straight into a larger randomised control trial so we can see whether this intervention is actually, you know, has legs that will work for, for more people? Yeah. We're trying to do both simultaneously. Um, and I've spoken to Israel a lot over the past couple of months about how something like this might translate to low-middle-income countries Amazing. as well. Um, so my hope is that we get something that will work cross-culturally, yeah. irrespective of resources, because it's not an expensive intervention. You don't need specialised equipment. It's just food yeah. um, or drinks. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, my, I, I have lots of ideas, yeah. um, but the assessment piece is, is our main priority at this point in time and trying to get some more support into low middle income countries. And then hopefully one day we can do a bigger baby eat. Yeah. Oh, that sounds amazing. And I, I absolutely love the synergies between your work and Israel's work and how those two bodies of work might join together it's at some point in the future. It's <laughs> pretty, pretty beautiful stuff. So yeah. thank you so much, Amanda, for joining us. And congratulations you, again on your PhD platform. Thank it was you. a magnificent presentation. Uh, to everyone listening, thank you for joining us. And there's plenty more to come from the conference. Bye. Yes, bye.